thanks everyone. Really honored to finally get to be with you all here again today and uh, represent our research group's work uh, in the Savo ecosystem of Kenya. So the Elephants in Sustainable Agriculture Kenya in Kenya project has been operating since 2016 in the Kasagawa Wildlife Corridor of southeastern Kenya. And these are just some of the amazing folks uh, that have been on the project um, and very happy to have gotten to do both my master's and my PhD work uh, in this ecosystem. And as probably everyone here uh, knows, African elephants are in trouble. Uh, populations are declining at about 8% per year. Uh, just over 400,000 remain uh, in the wild. And this, these numbers have been uh, complicated a bit by the recognition of forest elephants uh, and the uplisting of uh, African savanna elephants to endangered in uh, to 2022 uh, by the, the IUCN. Now, this uh, number does vary across the continent. Um, in some places, African elephants have been completely extirpated, and in the Savo ecosystem, populations are actually slowly rebounding and growing. So the Cascal Wildlife Corridor lies between uh, Savo East and Savo West, which are the country's two largest national parks. Now, our research uh, team was based out of Rukinga Ranch, as you can see there in the map in red. Uh, and this area is 13 community-owned ranches that are operated by Wildlife Works, which is one of the world's largest carbon offset projects. Um, and in exchange for preserving the wildlife and restoring that um, on the ranch, um, Community members are given disbursements, which they can use for various community uh, projects, such as uh, rebuilding schools, putting in uh, water tanks, and the like. So there's a deep community engagement uh, between uh, the company and the uh, local people. So as Lucy already alluded to, uh, this area is being very highly developed in Savo. Uh, we have the SGR Railroad, which has come in in the last uh, years. Um, and the corridor, you have to cross uh, the railroad, an additional railroad, a major highway, farms, businesses. So there's a lot of opportunity for interactions. Um, and most of the times, these can turn negative, especially at uh, night when elephants leave the safety of either the parks or the ranch and come into farmer lands and consume or trample crops. Now, um, this is further complicated by the fact that most of these are subsistence farmers. Uh, this area in particular is not your large industrial farms, and pretty much people are you know, eating what they're growing or they're selling them for their income. And most are living in multidimensional poverty, so farmers can often retaliate against uh, crop foraging. And uh, sometimes this is just from scaring away elephants, but sometimes they may shoot arrows or throw spears and try and attempt to harm elephants. So um, these interactions are dangerous for both people and the elephant population. So there's been a lot of different uh, experiments that our group has done in the last six to seven years, um, and I wanted to go over some of them. There's been several different uh, graduate students passing through and show you some of our significant results and talk about how perhaps some of those can be more widely applied uh, to human wildlife conflict in particular. And one of the first uh, things we did is we set up a paired control study in the village of Sisini um, and tested a variety of different uh, deterrent methods and their controls, uh, such as chili fences, uh, the metal strip fence, which my uh, Kenyan colleague, Mr. Simon Kasaini invented, uh, which is metal strips that hang on uh, wires that are around farms, makes a very loud a noise that elephants find quite annoying. Um, and then more traditional methods, such as acacia fences um, and beehive fences. Um, we really appreciated of, uh, our coordination with Lucy and her team and inclusion of uh, the metal strip fence in their uh, new amazing manual. Um, and our findings from here is that the beehive fences and combined double metal strips um, are the most effective at keeping elephants out of the crops. Uh, but we did see the trend of it was always more modern uh, methods that were more effective uh, than more traditional methods, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. So we did have a lot of uh, questions surrounding uh, the mixtures that are used in the chili pepper fences. Uh, so they tried to make a biochemist out of me for a semester. Uh, 
didn't work, no thanks, I'll stick with conservation. Uh, but we did go into the lab with the Advanced Materials Institute at Western Kentucky. Uh, and this was a really great um, illustration of uh, how we can do some uh, interdisciplinary work, um, even in conservation. Um, and we were trying to find a way that we could actually measure the amount of capsaicinoids, which is that active compound uh, that gives chili peppers their heat. Once you mix it with this, uh, you know, kind of really viscous, uh, uh, motor oil. And uh, we successfully actually created a method using liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. Can't believe I was able to say that. Um, that technique in the lab. So now we actually have a method to be able to look at different types of mixtures and see how, um, how the compound may compound may degrade over time and uh, you know how much of that heat is retained once you start mixing it in with the motor oil and putting it on the fences and you know having environmental impacts. Um, and we also went into the lab and did a mock chili fence, which is that bottom uh, picture there. And very interesting, we saw that um, the heat in the capsaicinoids did not degrade in over seven days, uh, which aligns with what um, you know, has been recommended as far as reapplication. Uh, so we did have one paper come out about this methodology in chromatographia, and we have another uh, chapter coming out in a book as well on some more of that work. And then we also were cataloging the elephants on Kinga Ranch for the first time. And we began to notice that a lot of the elephants had scars. Um, and, and some of them had even more recent uh, wounds and injuries. So when we were doing our driving transects, we saw this. And so we formed uh, three different hypotheses associated with this and actually found support for them. So we saw that males were much more likely than females to have scars. Uh, older males were more likely to have these scars than younger males. And they were much more likely to occur on the body of elephants or the abdomen area. So with the assumption that these are injuries from human uh, wildlife conflict and not elephant to elephant conflict, because these types of injuries are not usually seen um, in elephant to elephant interactions, this could potentially be adapted as some type of indicator to uh, you know, let conservation projects know how much potential conflict could be happening in their area either in the past or currently, um, if there was more information on being able to assess you know, when these wounds occurred. Uh, so we just had a full paper come out in that in animals about a month ago. And so for most of my PhD work, uh, I really wanted to look at some more of the human dimensions of these interactions. Uh, so this time we went, uh, tried to turn me into a sociologist, which was much better received than the uh, biochemist route. Um, so I had a lot of questions surrounding the attitudes and behaviors of farmers, you know, how they were really managing other livelihood threats such as climate change and drought, and how they really conceptualized these interactions with elephants. So to answer these questions, we went to the experts, the local people in the communities. Uh, we had a wonderful facilitator, uh, Ms. Helen Kiute, which conducted sessions for us. And we developed a survey with six of the surrounding uh, villages surrounding Rukinga Ranch. Um, and we, did, <clears throat> we created surveys and give these, gave these in Swahili and both English. And we use generalized linear models to look at the demographic categories of a lot of the participants and kind of compare those to some of the survey questions to see if we could kind of predict behaviors and attitudes. And for a second part of this, we also did participatory modeling sessions. And this was really using a biocultural approach and trying to investigate and understand a lot of the more economic and social impacts of these interactions. So we did participatory models with the groups. Uh, we reduced the sample size to a more manageable level, about 12 to 15 people for a village for a total of 77 uh, participants. Um, and we created these group mental models around how people conceptualize a lot of the drivers and the consequences of these interactions. And you can see from the picture on the right, these got very complex. So Helen was great at being able to take that central, um, central variable of the, of the conflict that people were experiencing and really draw connections between the different interacting parts and use system thinking to kind of diagram the system. So the results from our surveys, uh, the models weren't really predictive. Uh, at all and telling us you know, which categories or demographic categories uh, were 
engaging in certain behaviors. So we saw a real homogeneity of views. So this might seem like a very uninteresting result, but in fact, it's really um, helpful for practitioners because they know when we're, they're engaging with groups um, and trying to provide information, they can take more of a generalized approach. Um, but we did see that exposure was a really predictive variable in a lot of the models. And this was how often people had been given information about deterrence or seen information about how they can mitigate crop foraging. Um, but we did see some really interesting survey results, which can really help inform uh, forming policy and practice in this area. And we saw that 54% of the farmers that we surveyed used deterrence. So only half were using some form of deterrence against elephants, even though almost 100% of them were experiencing crop rating almost daily during the season. And some other interesting results we found, 78% of the farmers had never received any type of information about deterrence, no knowledge of that whatsoever, and even 90% on more specific types of fencing. And 87% of the farmers were using more traditional methods. So traditional methods are things like burning fires, you know, just chasing elephants out of crops. Um, this farmer uses a homemade whip that he makes uh, to go outside and just make a loud sound. So these are kind of high investment by the farmers. They usually have to be present, can be very dangerous, and ele elephants can often habituate to this quickly. Whereas more modern deterrents, like if you have fences, chili fences, uh, or the metal strip fence, may have a higher investment in the beginning, but often you don't have to be present for them to be effective. And so in the long term, they're usually a lot more effective. So farmers were using less effective, more potentially dangerous mm -hmm. methods. And so one of the most interesting results, we asked people, if you don't use deterrents, why? 100% of the people that did not use deterrence, which was about half of our sample size, wrote in, we can't afford it. We have economic constraints. So there's a huge barrier to being able to use types of deterrence, especially the more modern ones that, envire, that require some type of you know, financial investment up front. We also saw that 84% of the people in this system have some level of fear of elephants. So imagine living in a population where you're constantly afraid, not just for your personal safety, but for your economic livelihood as well. That can really uh, affect people's behavior and attitudes. Now, interestingly, we saw that 68% of farmers believed that they benefited somehow from the presence of wildlife. Now, this is a much higher than normal um, rate than uh, compared to a lot of studies. And this is likely due to the fact that the deep engagement that Wildlife Works has with the community. Uh, they hire rangers from within, so they're getting those disbursements. So it's kind of showing that potentially in the system, wildlife is working for the people. But I will say uh, one of the most discouraging results is having doing interviews and conversations with people. This time and time again, you heard the same story. You care more about the wildlife than they care about us. That was really, that really hits home. They care more about wildlife than they care about us. So again, that really affects behavior. Uh, just over half of the farmers, even if given some other means of earning a living, preferred to still farm. Now, with the environment changing, the potential of having farmers displaced because of climate change, that also brings up another issue of having this real cultural crisis, is that people that have farmed all their lives and may have to move away from the professions that they love. So from our modeling results, uh, we really saw the amazing value of local expertise. We had so many interesting variables and inputs into the system that we lumped them into four different categories. And we saw that environmental interactions and policy and management were the two key categories that were significant against all the others. So you see the power of this social ecological system and the importance to the stakeholders of how this is managed. And we had some interesting, unique variables emerge that I wish I had time to tell you about today, uh, but certain things like soil compaction. Farmers recognize that uh, when elephants come to farms more often, the soil is compacted, they may have to rent equipment to be able to till into the soil. So those are just a few of the results. So how do we use this valuable information that we gained from the community? Well, we designed community workshops with five different strategies to address a lot of their concerns. And we held these in the same six different villages. They received a take-home visual manual uh, in Swahili of all the things we talked about. And some of the, one of the main strategies was 
how to prevent crop foraging. So uh, we had local experts from several different fields come and do demonstrations, such as the beehive fence, uh, the metal strip fence, on how to build and, and create these deterrents. Uh, we had agricultural experts come and talk about climate smart agricultural techniques to improve crop yields, um, such as zye pits and U-bands, which are two indigenous techniques from Burkina Faso uh, that help retain rainwater when it comes down. Also, livelihood alternatives like the very successful basket weaving program that's occurring in the area. We had local rangers talk about elephant safety. Lucy mentioned it already. Uh, people really are engaging directly with elephants, which is very dangerous for, for all parties involved. Um, and talk about how to interact with elephant safety safely in the wild. The importance of environmental stewardship, not just in themselves, but the important place of elephants in the environment. So some of the big lessons and implications for conservation planning and prioritization, we saw that farmers are really not getting the vital information they need on preventing crop foraging in their environments. And this is a real challenge for us as practitioners is being able to reach these rural environments, uh, you know, in, deep in different parts of uh, the country where people may not have access to this information at R. And farmers are extremely fearful of elephants. This really impacts their behavior. But they have a uh, very limited ability to be able to respond to elephant crop foraging because of economic constraints. And stakeholder engagement is vital for understanding the complexity of these systems and the local context is key to be able to design management plans that work for people in these communities. And agencies can work with um, local stakeholders for <laughs> capacity strengthening to address other types of threats to livelihood in addition uh, to elephants and wildlife coming into farms such as climate change and other threats in the area. So I'd like to really thank our partners and everyone that was um, a big part of the support of this work thus far. Um, ex excited to take some of these lessons into my new role, uh, the Denver Zoo managing some conservation uh, priorities across the continent. And I know that was a lot of, for 12 to 15 minutes, so there's a QR code there where you can uh, links to my website. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions at all. I uh, love getting to meet new people and talk to them about it. Elephants. All right, that's it. Yeah.